today is novel launch systems. And our first speaker is Phil Swan of the Atlantis project on why the high cost of interplanetary space travel requires us to adopt a new approach. So uh, thank you, Phil. Humans first walked on the moon 55 years ago in 1969. How are we ready to take the next big leap? Well, first we need to ask ourselves, what is the next big leap? I don't think that it's enough for us for it to be a flags and footprints mission. That would just be setting foot on another world for the seventh time. The next big leap will probably be something more significant, such as finding the first seeds of consciousness on another world. To put it another way, earning a place in the history books means being credited with getting the ball rolling on the establishment of a permanent human presence on another world. This one involves sending quite a lot of mass, for example, a lot more mass than the mass of the International Space Station, to a distant destination such as Mars. I recently wrote a paper on launch costs versus delta V, which you can find online using this QR code. This is a chart from the paper that plots several different missions. It shows empirically that there's an exponential relationship between cost per kilogram and delta V. And this is not surprising, as these missions use chemical rockets, and rockets are subject to the tyranny of the rocket equation, which is also exponential in nature. Let's suppose that we decide we want to plant the first seeds of consciousness on Mars. What is the delta V requirement associated with setting up and supplying a base on Mars? Well, due to Earth and Mars's orbital eccentricity and inclination, it varies. This can be visualized with pork chop plots like this one, which are useful for finding the optimal launch dates and arrival dates. This table provides a rough idea of how much variability there is just leaving the vicinity of Earth and arriving in the vicinity of Mars. The maximum is about 50% greater than the minimum. But we need to consider that it may not always be possible to launch on the most optimal day and time due to, for example, technical reasons that cause a scrub or bad weather at the launch site. Many launches spread out over a couple weeks may be needed to vary all the supplies. Most of these launches can't be on the most optimal day. And finally, for crewed missions, it may be better to select a non-optimal but faster trajectory to reduce the cruise exposure to space radiation. So these considerations increase the delta V requirements. But the bottom line is, to plant the seed of consciousness on another world for the first time, we will need a system that's reliable across the full range of circumstances, from best case to worst case. And we need margin. We cannot afford to have a resupply mission fail. What this means is we're going to have a worst case delta V value that's more on the right side of this chart, such as here. If we're interested in mass that needs to make a round trip, such as crew and perhaps samples, then we're right up here the very right side of the graph. Now please keep in mind that both axes on this chart are using a log scale. So if I could please bring your attention over to the y-axis, you'll see that the cost for a one-way mission to Mars is in the order of tens of millions of dollars per kilogram. And the cost for the, the ground trip is in the order of tens of billions of dollars per kilogram. When you're conservative about making now, if you're wondering why rockets are so expensive, I too have been pondering this question. I've, I've heard a lot of theories. But back in 2003, somebody posed this exact question to Elon Musk, and I think he gave a pretty good answer. Why is it so expensive to send something into space? Well, let me tell you what makes a rocket hot. The energy and the velocity required to get into orbit is, is so substantial that compared to, say, a car or even a plane, the you have almost no margin to play with. Typically, uh, a launch vehicle will get about 2% of its liftoff mass to orbit. So, and that's the case for, for Bell. And so if you can only get 2% of what your rocket weighs to begin with to, to orbit, you, you can only, if you're wrong by 2%, you're not going to get anything to orbit. <laughs> you know, come cracking down the Pacific Dome. That means all of your calculations have to be right. If, if, you mis, if you miscalculate something, you get an answer wrong, it blows up. And, and it's very expensive trying to get all your answers right, and then double checking that they're right, and testing them all, and doing as much as you can on the ground. I think that's a lot of what makes rockets expensive. Now, 
Another question is, are rocket costs coming down? And if so, how fast? So some online content creators have created articles that suggest that lately the cost of chemical rockets or chemical rocket launch has been dropping quickly. This chart, for example, states that the cost of launching a spacecraft has dropped by 10x over the last decade. This orange dotted line has a slope of 10x over 10 years to give you an idea of what that looks like. But if we divide the current price of Falcon 9 launch, which is 69.75 million, by the payload of the reusable version of Falcon 9, which according to this tweet is about 9,571 kilograms, we get a price per kilogram of 7,287 US dollars in 2024. If we plot this data point on the chart, it ends up over here. So what about Falcon Heavy? At one time, there was some hope that Falcon Heavy would be cheaper than Falcon 9. But in practice, Falcon Heavy does not reuse its core stage. Also, we observe that SpaceX does not use Falcon Heavy to launch its Starlink satellites. So this evidence suggests that Falcon Heavy's cost per kilogram is at least comparable to Falcon 9's. So the Falcon Heavy data point should be placed roughly where we place the up-to-date Falcon 9 data point. Now, if we fit a line to the data, it becomes apparent that launch costs are falling at a rate of about 50% in 50 years, much slower than a lot of these articles would actually suggest. But the last data point down here says the Starship will cost $200 per kilogram in 2024. It is 2024. And Starship has not made it to a circularized the orbit yet, even with zero payload. So I think it's safe to say that this point is somewhat aspirational. OK, are there any alternatives to all rocket systems for space transportation? No, there aren't. So thank you very much. And uh, any questions after this? I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Around the turn of the century, that was literally a quarter of a century ago now, NASA and some other folks proposed that we could build a mass driver on Earth. Possibly the most thoroughly researched concept was a technology called StarTram. Now, there are several different variations of StarTram, but the most ambitious was to use a linear motor to accelerate a vehicle inside of an evacuated tube at ground level. And that's what this is showing here. There's a vehicle at the ocean. Then it would travel through up, up the side of a mountain and up through an elevated evacuated tube, and then finally it would travel through the rest of the atmosphere and out of space. Now, this idea didn't catch on, I think, for three primary reasons. First, it focuses on the problem of reaching low Earth orbit. And that takes a lot less delta V, and rockets are more competitive at lower delta V. So it's harder to compete with rockets if you just went to lower Earth orbit and not further away. Second, they propose that the elevated evacuated tube will be supported by the magnetic propulsion of giant rings of superconducting coils. Now, superconductors and cryogenic cooling systems are costly, and as far as I could tell, they didn't address any of the potential environmental concerns about, about these huge magnetic fields. And third, the third reason is the linear motor. Now, since StarTran was proposed, we've made some real progress with linear motors. For example, there are four linear motors installed on each four-class aircraft carrier for launching aircraft. They're called electromagnetic aircraft launch systems, or EMAPs. We know precisely what they cost from government reports and roughly what their capabilities are. I gave a presentation at the Electromagnetic Launch Conference earlier this year where I discussed how they scale. And the derivation of the scaling map is covered in the conference proceedings if you're interested. But the TLDR version is that the short paper I wrote argues that the cost of the power electronics in a linear motor will scale with a cube of its exit velocity. Now each EMAS launcher can launch 40 aircraft per day and does something like 600,000 tons per year. Now let's imagine we operated one at this high launch rate, but that we also scale up its length and its exit velocity to orbital speeds. We get a cost curve like this. Theoretically, it would be cheaper than an all rocket system for the kind of history making space program we're talking about. Like, it is cheaper down here than these two points. But unfortunately, if you're going to Mars, there are only a couple of weeks every two years when you can travel to Mars efficiently. So I think the most fundamental problem with the Star Trek concept is that the cost of, lin of the linear motor technology, specifically the power handling hardware in it, doesn't scale well enough to compete with rockets. 
By the way, the Starshine proponents published an FAQ that acknowledges that the power storage and switching are a major challenge for this technology. It's what's known in the business of mass routers as the switching problem. Okay, this brings me to a new concept called variable pitch screw launch for VPSL. While it looks similar to Starshine on the surface, it's fundamentally different because it solves the switching problem. In fact, it eliminates all the costly components, such as capacitors, superconductors, and pulse power electronics, which are typically distributed along the entire length of most mass driver designs. Now, I don't want to bury the lead here, so to cut to the chase, we created a digital twin implementation of this technology. And embedded within the digital twin is a cost model, which I use to generate a cost curve for an Earth to Mars space program. This short line down here is that cost. Now it shows that the cost per kilogram for, for the system is significantly lower than the cost with an all rocket system or with all rocket systems. This cost per kilogram includes the cost of servicing the debt incurred to build the launcher. The design we model lands 11 tons on Mars per vehicle launched. I assume 560 launches over 10 years, or 10 Mars transfer windows, sorry, for a total of 6,182 <coughs> tons landed on Mars. So in this analysis, the capital costs are amortized over just 560 launches, not 300,000 launches, which was the assumption for the emails cost curve. So that's pretty reasonable. Now, to summarize, VPSL is a new alternative to launch technology. It's backed up by a digital twin and a comprehensive cost model. And its cost model shows it to be significantly cheaper than chemical rockets in the context of a space program that we might want to embark on soon. Okay, let me provide you with some more context on how it works before explaining in more detail how it manages to be cost effective. So the launch system has two variable pitch screws that are supported by brackets. If you look closely, you can see that the screws are made up of lots of individual screw segments. And electric motors inside the screw segments rotate the screws at a very high RPM. Now, this video is slowed down to one one hundredth of normal speed. But at normal speed, the screw flies are spinning too quickly to see. Please keep in mind that they are sped up to operational speed over several minutes or even hours prior to the launch. And then their rotational speed is kept constant during the launch. So the screws don't consume large amounts of energy in a short period of time. That is, they don't require a lot of power. In fact, when they are not being used to launch spacecraft, they can be used as a spinning reserve to help stabilize the left recruits. Uh, when the camera is traveling with the vehicle alongside it, you can see the screws flights. But now, you, now the brackets are moving too fast to see. The brackets also support a rail. A magnetically levitated sled carrying the spacecraft travels down this rail between the screws. There is also a component called an adaptive nut that pushes the launch vehicle down the track on its sled. Now the adaptive nut has a system of actuators called grappers. These grappers engage with the screw plates to accelerate the sled forward. At the ends of the grappers, there are these electromagnetic pads Green. These pads are mag magnetically attracted to the backs of the screw flights, but they never make direct physical contact. So the variable pitch screw design does not rely on rapidly switching electromagnets on and off in series as the vehicle travels past. When the pads are engaged with the screw flights, they're always on. They only turn off temporarily when the pad needs to be repositioned to adapt to the geometry of the screws that would kind of link kind of like the launcher. Acceleration is achieved by essentially surfing a mechanical wave created by the spinning screw plates. So kinetic energy stored within the screw is transferred to the adaptive nut and then to the sled carrying the vehicle. However, the energy transfer does not involve implementing any kind of linear electric motor. It's more like a magnetic worm gear. Therefore, there are no power electronics in this design. They quickly convert stored electrical energy into kinetic energy on the fly. And this is fundamentally why the design scales better. It's the reason why this architecture's cost scales with velocity squared instead of velocity cubed. And to help inform our understanding of the cost and to refine the design, we've been constructing the first in a series of small scale prototypes. This prototype has brushless DC motors housed within 3D printed screw segments. And for this small scale prototype, we opted to go with a mechanical connection between the screw flights and the sled. However, we have a developmental roadmap that outlines a series of progressively more complex, larger, and more full-featured prototypes. The full-scale version has been implemented as a digital twin 
and upload it to GitHub. The digital twin was used to create the animations that I showed a few slides back, and this chart shows some of the telemetry from a simulated launch. This table lists a few of the design parameters from the digital twin. There are currently 659 such parameters that describe the complete design. The most interesting is perhaps the capital cost. Currently it's calculated to be 32.6 billion US dollars, which is a value that's much more in line with what space programs or space agencies are willing to spend on Apollo or Artemis class space programs. If we don't invest in alternative launch infrastructure, I fear that economically speaking, a human presence on Mars will remain forever out of reach. There are a lot of aspects to this design that I didn't have time to cover today, such as why it's much cleaner technology than rockets, how we would propose to support the elevated evacuated tube, fast airlocks at the end of the tube, um, and the vehicle's flight regime after exiting the evacuated tube. However, if you're interested in learning more, you can find some papers and videos on the projectalignus.com website. This QR code will take you to one video if you want. Okay, to conclude, this presentation set out to explain why we need to adopt a new approach. We need to adopt a new approach because we want to achieve a historic milestone in not only spaceflight, but in the history of humanity. We need to travel further afield. And further afield requires more delta V. And it's very expensive to achieve that extra delta V using all rocket systems. The concept of a mass driver for a space launch has gained limited traction in the past because of its projected high capital cost. And because most of the market for space launch services is currently to destinations close to Earth, such as LEO and GEO, where rockets are still relatively cheap. Furthermore, most mass driver designs use pulse power hardware. And that hardware's cost scales with a cube of the exit velocity. This cost is being proportional to the cube relationship has made these earlier designs prohibitively expensive. The key is to select an architecture that scales well to the kinds of speeds we need for space travel, and the key to that is eliminating the components for cost scales of the cube of the exit velocity. The variable pitch screw launcher is an example of such an architecture. It's a human rated mass driver without cubic cost growth. It's infrastructure, and it's an entirely new class of launcher or launchers that can significantly accelerate our progress as a space faring civilization. A full-scale version capable of launching a spacecraft to Mars would be three to four orders of magnitude cheaper than all rocket systems. Therefore, our findings are that this architecture and possibly other architectures where cost scales with the exit velocity squared will be highly relevant to achieving the next historic milestone in the history of space flight. I want to end with some words of wisdom from JFK. When he pitched Apollo to Congress in 1961, he said, for while we cannot guarantee that we shall one day be first, we can guarantee that any failure to make this effort will make us last. Thank you, and if after the session you have any questions uh, or would like to learn more, I hope you'll seek me out.